to begin, I wanted to jump off of Rob's point with a bit of an illustrative story, something that I've noticed in my time here. Uh, once a year, the, the Chinese government has what's called the Lianghui, the two sessions of the National People's Congress, its national top legislature, and the Chinese People's Political uh, Association, uh, which is the consultative uh, guiding body, which has membership from the non-communist parties and various sectors of society. So it's a big meeting, happens every year at the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. Um, previous to the pandemic, I went every year to cover it as part of my job. And I, both times that I've been there, uh, I've been there twice, the last two have been pandemic times. And so attendance has been limited for obvious reasons. Um, but on both occasions, I saw the same thing happen, which was, this is also a time whenever uh, Western media comes, um, the, the big media from the United States, the UK, Western Europe, elsewhere, they come kind of with a smug, smarmy attitude about the proceedings treating it as if it's a, it's a big charade, it's a big rubber stamp, uh, non-ceremony, non-efficacious uh, uh, pr uh, process. But the photographers, it's interesting, it's an interesting point to be made about perception. Every time I, every time I was there, both times I was there, uh, I saw with my own eyes, a photographer undoubtedly from one of these outlets, either uh, when taking a picture framing the picture so that there was a there was a uniformed police officer in the frame with the great hall or and this was the funniest one uh someone holding the camera getting their their shot framed of the hall and waiting until there was a procession of, of police officers coming by to then snap the photo uh just to maximize the effect so it shows you know it shows you that you you see what you want to see um but i'd like to i'd like to to go from there and, and say that we're here to talk about the 100 years of the Communist Party of China. Uh, and I want to be very clear in my emphasis of the 100 years. We're not separating the history of the party or the country by eras. We're not taking one part of history and saying this part was good and this part was bad. Uh, in either direction, we're not saying that the last 42 years were better than the previous 72 years in the PRC. We're not saying, we're not picking a period of history and saying this was this was the good times and this then there was some original sin that ruined everything the way some people on the left tend to do. We're talking about the 100 years because it is a constant history. It is an unbroken line. And any attempt to divide that line and create an artificial separation between eras to uphold one at the expense of another uh, misses the bigger picture. So what we want to talk about, especially and, and in reference to this centenary is the fact that this is the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party and the seven and 72 years since that party has been in power uh, and, and founded the People's Republic of China, Socialist China. It's in the name of the organization that, that uh, put this event together. So it's also important to think about the, 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 the beginnings of the party itself, the, as, as was mentioned, you know, some 13 Chinese delegates and two international representatives were attending the first National Congress of the Communist Party, representing just over 50 members total. That party, it was just released, is now numbering at over 95 million, about 95 million members. So for those of us in the West, in communist parties in the West, who may be looking at our membership roles and thinking perhaps <laughs> that we have a long way to go, we do, but everybody starts somewhere. So something to consider. Uh, something else to consider with the 95 million members that uh, make up the party, that the majority in, in terms of the vocations, in terms of the, the societal stratum that the membership comes from, the majority come from what we would traditionally think of as the working class base, farmers, fishermen, herdsmen, uh, service workers, uh, workers in factories, technicians, people that are not considered the elites, people that don't run things uh, in the West. These are the vast, these are the uh, very, make up a sizable majority of the members of the CPC. Uh, retirees, students, other groups. So why? Why do these people join the party? Why do they do it? There's an attempt by many uh, when reporting about the Communist Party to say that it's all self-interested, that people join the Communist Party because they want a promotion or a better job or they want better career prospects or social prospects or what have you. And then for some that may be true. We can't probe the minds and the hearts of every individual party member, but what we can see is that the vast majority of membership comes from a, a position 
that grants them very little in terms of their social and career privileges because they're in what are traditionally thought of as, uh, you know, uh, I guess, well, in, in the pejorative, you would think of it as, uh, uh, people in the West may think of it as lesser work, as, as work that's not so prestigious, shall we say. So what, wh why join? What's the, what's the purpose? There can't be self-interest because again, there's, you know, there's only so far you can go in these fields. So what motivates someone to do it? There's a few answers that I think we can give and that we, that we can think about. Um, first of all, thinking about what China looked like before 1949, what China looked like in 1921, and what it looks like now. Now that's been articulated in great detail already, but I want, I want you to think about a person, and there are many people that are old enough to remember, who are older than 72, who remember what China was like before the CPC took power. You think about this semi-feudal, semi-agrarian society where the, the GDP per capita was in the hundreds of dollars, if even that, I think less, in fact. Uh, you think about the life expectancy being 35 roughly uh, for men and a little bit higher for women, but still very, very young. Um, you think about a country that had over 80% illiteracy. You think about a country that had an infant mortality rate in the very high figures. And from 49 to now, but also from 49 to 78. So again, we're not separating this by eras. This progress has been constant. This progress has been unyielding there has not been a time where there was not positive developments happening in the country. The life expectancy doubled to now 77, uh, outstripping the U.S. among some demographics now. Uh, literacy is now illiteracy is now below three percent among the population of the country. Infant mortality is now practically non-existent uh, compared to what it used to be. These basic quality of life factors. So you think about that. You think about the progress people have witnessed, and you realize this is why people still join. This is why people still feel the need to be a part of this great national project. It's, it's not that there is some ulterior motive. And in fact, you don't really get in with an ulterior motive or you have to, you have to deceive quite a few people because the process of joining the party is very strenuous. Uh, it requires approval from multiple members. It requires a probationary period of about a year. You have to dedicate yourself. You, have, you become part of something greater when you take your oath. I've seen many times uh, I went to the, the red boat site in, in Jiaxing in Zhejiang province where the, the first national Congress was concluded. And when I was there, I saw three different groups of people raising their fist and taking the party oath. And, and I saw that when I was in Yan'an, the revolutionary base area where the red army fought and consolidated its forces and eventually won. There are many historical sites there now and there are sites where people go and retake their oaths or take their oaths for the first time. And, and part of that oath is to serve the people wholeheartedly and to put the interest of the people above your own. And this is, this is enforced through various means that we could go into if we had more time on this topic. But the point is, you may, even if you have the idea that you might get some benefit, you cannot rest on your laurels as a party member. You are required to maintain a log, a, a study log. You are required to take part in study sessions. You have to take part in volunteer activities, whether you want to or not. This is your role as a party member. So even if people go into it with certain motives in mind, by the structure of the party, by the nature of the party, by the fact that serve the people, Wei Wei Min Fu Wu is still the motto, you have to do these things. So it's not up to you. You volunteer to join this organization and you take on the mantle of someone who's willing to serve the people wholeheartedly. So as we heard so much about in uh, General Secretary Xi's speech on Thursday. Um, so really, uh, as far as the present day, I think it's also important to consider in addition to the history, in addition to the progress, uh, this, this notion, not just of, of of, of self-confidence, which is important, of course, because China, as we know, is a country that was subjugated for over a century by foreign powers. And now it is standing up on its own two feet. Mao Zedong himself said the Chinese people have stood up in October, 1949. But there's more to it than that because there have been many national liberation stories that have been greater, that, that have been a success, that have shown great promise, but they don't have the same level of, of accomplishment, I think, that China does because it was a revolution for national liberation, but it was also a revolution, a socialist revolution for the betterment of the people, to make people the masters of the country, to elevate everyone. So you may have success stories for national liberation that were sidetracked 
by the underlying contradictions of the capitalist systems that were maintained in those countries. China has not frowned upon letting in foreign investment or foreign expertise, but the key difference, and this is key to its development over the last 42 years especially, is that although it is letting in foreign investment, it is not letting in foreign exploitation. You can come in and do business in China. You can, you can make money. You know, the, the, there is an element of, of, of uh, benefit, but it takes place on the terms that were set by the party and the people to the point where you can't just wander in and take over an entire industry and turn it private. You can't, you can't bring in your multinational behemoth companies and dictate to the government what you want or don't want the way it happens so often in other places. You have to play by the rules. And if you don't play by the rules, you don't get to do business. That's just how it is. And that's one of the many things that makes China's revolution and development so distinct from other countries, which is why one of the many reasons why, and there's not enough time to get into all of them because we'd be here for hours, uh, that I believe China's condition, development, situation, and path is unique and still worthy of being called socialist. So uh, I'm going to wrap it up there because I'm running along. I'm running along my time, but I appreciate it very much. Thanks for letting me speak.